This will be a presentation on low back pain. Uh, some objectives, uh, we want to be able to provide differential diagnosis, treatment, management, and explanation for common causes of low back pain, including mechanical, degenerative, neurologic, inflammatory, and referred. Uh, so we're going to address biomechanics of low back pain, uh, the effects of performing OMT to address these biomechanical relationships. Uh, from a neurologic model, we want to identify the nerves that cause pain in these disorders, whether it's referred or primary. A behavioral model, behavioral modification that may be useful in the treatment of the above conditions and or exercises uh, that we've discussed previously. Indications and contraindications for OMM. And um, your DSA also has some uh, relevant literature uh, for evidence-based uh, treatment of low back pain. So low back pain, uh, extremely significant. You will encounter it in almost any area of medicine you go into. It affects 5% of adults daily. 18% of, of people in the United States have had low back pain in the past month. In a lifetime, 60 to 70% of people will deal with a significant episode of low back pain. So odds are it uh, you'll see it clinically. It'll affect your um, patients. It'll affect you or people you know. And 25% of them, only 25% of these patients, uh, seek medical attention. Uh, so not everybody that comes in for, for low back pain. And it's one of the top three reasons people go to their family medicine doctor. Uh, so they see, family medicine doctors actually see more low back pain than any other specialist, more than ortho or neurosurgery combined, so which is uh, pretty significant. And if you're a DO, uh, you're even going to see probably more uh, cases of low back pain because you're expect oh you're a DO you're you're good with musculoskeletal stuff you're good with low back pain so it's important to to know for uh, multiple reasons and you got to live up to the osteopathic reputation uh, why differential for low back pain uh, mechanical we're going to focus a lot on um, but also don't forget about uh, Neoplastic causes, if there's metastatic disease to the bone, inflammatory uh, diseases, we'll talk about it uh, briefly. Infectious, we won't talk as much about in this um, presentation, but you know, if you're looking for redness, swelling, fever, uh, or in case of herpes zoster, a, a rash, uh, those types of things can lead to an infectious etiology of uh, low back pain. Metabolic, compression fractures, Paget's disease, uh, referred pain for major viscera, so uh, throughout the year we'll be talking about various diseases and the referred pain patterns. Today we'll briefly talk about how the urogenital system and the aorta uh, can refer pain to this area. But almost 97 percent of low back pain is considered mechanical and if you break that down into degenerative joint disease, herniated discs, compression fractures, spinal stenosis, spondylolisthesis, uh, we'll talk about all that, but that does not add up to 97%. So a huge proportion, um, above 70%, has no known medical cause. And so that's where it falls into the nonspecific low back pain, lumbar sprain and strain. But this is also where somatic dysfunction and confluence you can, can fall into. So you can make a huge impact on patients with low back pain. Um, arrive at a diagnosis, and if there's no other medical diagnosis, the primary treatment can be osteopathic manipulative medicine. As always, it's important to consider red flags for any disease states. These are uh, conditions that need urgent or emergent treatment and you don't want to miss. So even though they're not that common, less than 5% of low back pain is one of these uh, more severe uh, conditions, you, you, again, you don't want to miss it, especially uh, fracture. You want to know that information so you don't uh, prescribe a harmful treatment to them. Caudic Quinas syndrome would be the urgent emergent um, uh, disease state, so urinary retention, overflow incontinence, fecal incontinence, bilateral symptoms. They need uh, surgical decompression uh, immediately most of the time. Um, infections or cancer, uh, you don't want to miss a uh, cancer and let them go you know, three more months of conservative care on their low back pain when they've got a metastatic disease that needs diagnoses. Uh, Spondyloarthropathies, HLA-B27, ankylosing spondylitis, um, not as, doesn't need urgent emergent treatment per se, uh, but getting treatment rheumatologically um, with some disease modifying agents can be 
can be valuable in some of these patients. So again, even though they're less common, you want to make sure to rule out any uh, bad infections, cancers, or neurologic deficits. All right, so there's a 65-year-old female presenting with low back pain that radiates down her right thigh. The pain is dull, uh, but sharp when she extends her leg or moves too quickly. She has had mild pain for some time, but it flared up two weeks ago after doing a lot of yard work. The pain has not really improved with rest or with ibuprofen. Um, so pretty standard uh, presentation. They got uh, pain that started after yard work. She's got a little bit of pain in her leg. So we worked through a lot of that. When did it start? What makes it better? What makes it worse? Radiation of pain. Um, additionally, we've got quantify the pain. 7 out of 10. It's dull. Uh, moves her buttock and upper thigh. Started six weeks ago. She denies numbness, tingling, or weakness. Denies fever, chills, bowel or bladder incontinence. So we're feeling uh, less likely going to be a uh, infectious or a uh, catequina picture. Past medical history, no cancer, no IV drug use. Um, physical exam, two out of four reflexes in the patella and the Achilles region, which is normal. Straight leg raise is painful at 75 degrees. Uh, sensation and strength are equal and intact bilaterally. So normal strength, normal sensation, normal reflexes. So we should already be working through our differential at this point. Uh, so again, just some highlights on when you're taking a history. Um, it's You don't necessarily have a script of questions that you go through. You have a list of diagnoses, and you're trying to rule in and rule out. So you know, place them in the categories, acute versus chronic. So if it's greater than 12 weeks, that's considered chronic. Um, and up to 90%, depending on your st statistics, 70-90% of low back pain should resolve in eight weeks. Um, regardless of intervention, so most of them are self-limiting and will resolve on their own. Um, so an acute presentation puts you in one bucket where a chronic might lead you to some of those other things. Why isn't it getting better? We need to investigate that a little further. Your old carts is always helpful to use, onset, location, duration, etc. to help you work through some of this differential, uh, but don't necessarily have to ask every question on every patient. Use that to uh, guide your differential. The information you get from one question should guide you through the next questions. And again, always looking for red flags, any trauma, any cancer, weight loss, fecal or urinary incontinence, saddle anesthesia, severe morning stif stiffness, sensory motor deficits. Uh, those will lead you to some of these uh, more significant diagnoses um, that you would need to identify early. And again, physical exam. We always want to do a, a thorough physical exam. Um, visually inspecting the area of pain, looking for rashes or heat or uh, evidence of trauma or bruising, active and passive range of motion, special tests, uh, Patrick's test or Faber's test, straight leg raise, Thomas test, we'll, we'll, uh, I'll talk about those next. Neurologic exam and your osteopathic exam should be a part of this uh, diagnosis. Your somatic dysfunction diagnosis may lead you to the ultimate treatment, which is OMT, or it may give you clues of other underlying disease processes that you need to examine. So a thorough physical exam is always um, important. So the Patrick test, uh, or Faber, which is flexed abduction and external rotation. Sometimes there's another E on there for extension. Um, you'll see both. But basically it's this figure four test. So this is the abducting, externally rotating of the hip. Uh, so if there's limited range of motion, that's some evidence. If they have pain with that, that's other evidence. If it's more an anterior pain, think of hip. If it's more of a posterior low back, think SI joint. So it's pretty nonspecific, um, but it can give you um, evidence of range of motion and pain and where their pain is uh, to lead you uh, towards a diagnosis. Straight leg raise. Um, you can see the physician lifts the leg in question and... Um, passively uh, flex the hip while keeping the knee extended. So if you've got radicular pain down the leg, especially if it reproduces the patient's symptoms, that's a positive test. So again, radicular pain is usually sharp electric shooting pain and not just tightness from a hamstring. So it's hard to elicit that. But if they got pain in this 30 to 70 degree uh, arc, um, most accurately 40 degrees seems to be where the uh, literature suggests that could be be an acute inflamed disc pushing on a nerve. A contralateral positive straight leg raise is sometimes even more specific, so less sensitive, so you may miss some, but if it is present, so that's you lift the opposite leg and they get shooting leg, pain down the 
leg in question. So you so in this picture, if the doctor is lifting the left leg and they get pain shooting down the right leg, that is a positive contralateral uh, straight leg raise, meaning there's a problem on the right uh, a nerve going down the right leg. Thomas test um, is assessing for psoas muscle tightness. So you have the patient flex both of the knees to the chest, release one leg, and attempt to lie it flat on the ground. Um, so for example, if uh, this here looks like he's pulling his left leg towards his chest, and you can see this right leg does not lay flat, that tells you there's a problem in that right uh, psoas. So there's tightness in the right psoas preventing this leg from extending fully. A neurologic exam, um, it's always important to know your nerve roots. Uh, where the sensation and the motor function are for this. Uh, so this is a nice uh, summary in a, from this chart from Kelly's textbook of rheumatology. So for disc 3 or 4, three, four the nerve affected is L4. You're going to lose dorsiflexion of the foot, sensory loss on the medial foot, and the patellar reflex is lost, L4, L5, L5 nerve root. And you will lose motor function of the dorsiflexion of the great toe, the dorsal foot is affected. No particular reflex that's commonly used for L5. L5, S1, S1 nerve root, plantar flexion of the foot is the motor loss, the lateral foot is the sensory loss, and the Achilles or ankle reflex uh, could be affected as well. So we had our patient that came in. She had some off and on back problem for a while. Um, and worsened with activity. Let's say, for example, we've got this x-ray uh, showing some degenerative changes. So as you can see, there, these disc spaces are narrowed. You can, um, this one's a little more normal here at the top, but these bottom two are definitely narrowed disc spaces. We see some um, bone spurring, osteophyte formation along the vertebrae edges, and you can see this L4 is actually slipped forward on L5, so it's a, a spondylolisthesis of L4 on L5. Um, so a lot of degenerative changes noted here in this particular x-ray. So disc generation is believed to be the first step in the degeneration of the spine. The hydration of the discs also changes as the water content drops, so a drier disc doesn't handle the mechanical stressors as well. Um, and then if the disc degenerates and narrows, the facet joints settle uh, and have increased stress on them across the facet joints. So this leads to facet joint degeneration, hypertrophy, and osteophyte formation. So again, the, the disc is the first thing that goes, hydration is decreased, and if the disc isn't doing its normal function of support, weight is placed on other areas, including the facet joints, which leads to more wear and tear. It becomes a vicious cycle. So in this example, you can see that is the spondylophytes, as they're calling them, so just that um, arthritic change is noted from the generation. And here you can see that disc is drying, becoming more compressed. You've got these um, bone spurring spondylophytes uh, here, um, and you can imagine how that would affect the facet joints, putting more weight on the facet joints as the discs are not doing their job. And you can see that would impact spinal motion as well. You're going to have less motion in those segments. So the facet joints can be a, a significant source of pain um, as they get more stress placed on them and they get wearing and tearing. So there's actually this little medial branch of the dorsal primary rami of the spinal nerve comes back there and innervates that. Uh, so they would uh, that's a source of pain, uh, localized people, they actually do injections to block this nerve or even burn this nerve with something called a rhizotomy uh, for people with spinal joint, uh, excuse me, facet joint pain. And just a brief reminder of your facets and how they're different in different orientation in different areas of the spine. In the lumbar spine, they're facing back, up, medial, and more in the sagittal plane. So sagittal plane, remember the bumble bum mnemonic, the BUM, back, up, and medial, uh, for the lumbar spine. So some uh, terminology you need to understand. Spondylosis is kind of a general term used for degenerative changes anteriorly 
on the discovertebral joints and posterior laterally on the facet joints. Um, as, you, as we saw in that original x-ray and this x-ray, you see joint state space narrowing, sclerosis, osteophytosis, all those wear and tear uh, changes, the narrowing, osteophytosis, uh, sclerosis um, from degeneration. So spondylosis is a general term used to describe all those processes. Not to be confused with spondylolisthesis. Spondylolisthesis, I think it's the long word, the listhesis, that's uh, the slipping motion. Uh, so keep that straight in your brain. And then spondylolysis is the defect of the pars interarticularis, most commonly at L5. So lysis, think lysis, that thing got lysed and eliminated. Um, so it could be a fatigue fracture developed early in life, and it can progress to spondylolisthesis in 15% of patients. So that would be this. So we have that fracture, L5 starts to move forward on S1. That's a spondylolisthesis, spondylolysis. So many people, they, <clears throat> many people remain stable with the fractures uh, throughout their lives, but they can progress to a listhesis. Uh, spondylolisthesis can be graded based on how far they slip forward in relation to the vertebrae below. So grade zero, there's no slippage yet, so that would just be spondylolisthesis. One, zero to 24 percent. Two, 25 to 50 or 25 to 49, 3, 50 to 74, 4, 75 to 100, and 5 it actually completely displaces or spondylotosis, so um, that would be bad. So a lateral x-ray is good to visualize that. You can see this with the, the magic red arrow sign. You've got a pars uh, fracture at that level, but no slippage at this point. So spondylolysis. So quick recap, spondylolisthesis, um, again that's the slippage, the anterior slippage, so that's going to be worse by extension usually, sometimes flexion can make that worse, but an extension motion, motion obviously leads to more slipping uh, forces on the vertebrae and anterior motion and that can increase the pain, it's often associated with hamstring tightness and, hum and lumbar hyperlordosis, especially with younger patients. A uh, physical exam, you may see uh, lumbar tenderness or a step-off sign. If it's a severe problem, you can actually feel a depression above and below the spinous processes. We saw a diagnosis via lateral lumbar x-ray, and you can treat with uh, physical therapy, osteopathic manipulation, bracing, uh, anti-inflammatories uh, for conservative stable cases. But if they are progressing or if there's signs of uh, neurologic deficits or rapid progression, they need to be stabilized surgically. Uh, facet syndrome is pain caused by increased load on the spinal facet joints and during the degener degenerative process. So that medial branch of the dorsal primary rami of the spinal nerve causes some radiation into the leg. Uh, so you can get some radiation pattern from a facet joint syndrome. It should be different than that radicular symptom, however. Pain is often worse with extension because that loads the facet joints, puts more weight on the irritated joint. Some bar the superior lumbar facets face medially and dorsally and are oriented in the sagittal plane. All right, let's talk about another case. A 56-year-old male presents to the clinic with a lower back pain. The pain started about a week ago. He denies any injury and states he sits at a desk most of the day. Pain is located more on the right than on the left, but the pain seems to radiate partly down the back of his left leg. It seems to be worse when standing up after prolonged sitting. Denies numbness, tingling, or weakness. So on exam, you notice that he stands to greet you. Notice he's slightly hunched over and leaning toward the right. Reflexes are 2 out of 4. Strength is 5 out of 5. Sensation is normal. Straight leg raise is mildly painful on the left. Um, again, so the neurologically reflexes and strength and sensation are normal. Uh, he's got some radiation down the back of his left leg. Complains of pain um, in the lower back sits a lot, denies any injury. So what could this be? Well, let's do, we did the Thomas test, and we noted that there is some psoas muscle tightness. And it's a classic case of psoas syndrome, actually. So uh, you get that slightly flexed posture leaning toward the side of the tight psoas because of the function of the psoas, the hip flexor. You've got a positive so uh, Thomas test. You'll often get a type 2 upper lumbar dysfunction that you need to treat to completely resolve this. 
uh, just because of that attachment of the psoas uh, can kind of maintain that. So we got maybe it's a facilitation, maybe it's a mechanical, uh, but it seems to be important to treat the lumbar along with the psoas um, to get full resolution. They get a pelvic shift to the contralateral side and they get a contralateral piriformis dysfunction and a sacral dysfunction. So let's look at that on a uh, picture. So just to look at that again, so this left-sided psoas spasm, so imagine you're going to get uh, tightness and bending forward into the left. This is going to cause uh, the type uh, 2 lesion in one of these upper lumbar segments towards the side, side bend and rotate towards the side of the psoas spasm as you'd expect. There's going to be a side shift, so just imagine all that tension pulling down the left. It's going to shift the pelvis to the opposite side, which is also going to create some piriformis spasm on the opposite side, which could irritate that sciatic irritation. So in this patient, they had a little bit of pain with the uh, straight leg raise on the opposite side, uh, and that's would explain be explained by this piriformis, and then a torsion, a sacral torsion with the oblique axis on the side of the psoas spasm. So in this case, it's a left psoas spasm, side bend, rotated left, and a left oblique axis, right piriformis, right side shift. So there's two things to the opposite side, and then one, two, uh, three things to the same side if you want to break them up that way. So get a mechanical picture of how this works, um, and it'll uh, be easier to keep straight in your head. Piriformis syndrome kind of ties into this. So just because you have a piriformis somatic dysfunction doesn't necessarily mean you have piriformis syndrome. But piriformis syndrome can appear as a sciatica, which is just that radiating pain down the back of your legs. Um, so from this data, they said about 6% of the cases of a sciatica were actually piriformis syndrome, more common in females, worse with prolonged sitting, trauma, anatomic variation of the piriformis muscle or asymmetry and also psoas syndrome. So as you can see some of these piriformis muscles the sciatic nerve is split or pierces through the piriformis. Uh, there's some controversy as to how much this leads to um, low back pain or sciatica. Uh, so there may be some controversy there but from an osteopathic perspective it can definitely uh, make sense of how structure influences function. So piriformis syndrome, you're also often going to find tenderness in the piriformis muscle or the tendon. So you can treat that if, if you've got somatic dysfunction or the full syndrome. You can treat with counter strain, tender point, or uh, treat as a myofascial trigger point. Sometimes we use injections for those if they're fibrotic and radiating pain. It's going to cause external rotation of the hip, positive straight leg raise sign sometimes, and possible gluteal atrophy just because of the innervations of the uh, the sciatic nerve branches or the gluteal nerves that branch in that region um, can be influenced. Um, an external rotation of the hip is obviously because the piriformis is an external rotator. All right, another case, a 49-year-old female presents with a history of chronic back pain. She complains of radiating pain into her right leg. The straight leg reveals some pain at 80 degrees. Reflexes, strength, and sensation are all normal. She has been told she has multiple bulging discs, but epidural steroid injections have failed to improve her pain. Osteopathic exam reveals lumbar hypertonicity bilaterally, a deep sacral sulcus on the right, posterior and inferior ILA on the left. The spring test is positive, and the right superior anominate uh, is sheared superiorly. So relatively normal neurologic exam. So the straight leg raise at 80 degrees, some pain. Uh, didn't say it was ridiculous, it's outside the normal range, so that's uh, less classic for a disc problem. We've got a lot of somatic dysfunction of the sacrum and pelvis as well, so make sure you remember how to diagnose and treat those. And this fits in well to uh, what Dr. Greenman, who was a osteopathic physician who recently passed away, he wrote a book called Principles of Manual Medicine. Uh, one of the original muscle energy authors as well. He did a lot of work with the original muscle energy study group, so a big name in our profession. Passed away a few years ago, unfortunately. Uh, but he described these dirty half dozen for back pain that um, had disabling low back pain that had failed other treatments. So non-neutral lumbar somatic dysfunctions, 
So that's type twos. That's why we we encourage you to find type 2 dysfunctions and not just group curves because they tend to be more clinically significant. Pubic shears, so looking for superior and inferior pubic shears, so you have to check for the pu check the pubes, should be one of the first things you check. Posterior sacral base or backward torsion, so again those are non-physiologic, those backward sacral torsions, so anything with the posterior sacral base, so that would be an extension, unilateral extension as well. A nominate shear, so that's a, primarily a superior um, anominate shear. So the whole anominate is up. Make sure you've got that straight in your head, how that's different from a pubic shear where just the pubic bone is affected. Short leg and pelvic tilt, pelvic tilt syndrome. So we talked about short legs uh, previously. And muscular imbalance of the trunk and lower extremity. Um, and that could include psoas syndrome as well. Uh, so you may be treating, you may be doing some exercise and stretching or treating with osteopathic manipulation these uh, commonly found somatic dysfunctions for failed back syndrome. And as we kind of summarize um, a lot of different radiating patterns we've alluded to, I just want to point out that not everything that radiates is a nerve pain. Uh, so again, we mentioned facet joints, how they can radiate. So here's some various uh, facet joint radiation patterns. Sacroiliac joint uh, can radiate down the leg as well. Muscles can radiate, what we call trigger points. So this is for glute minimus. Now you get a, if you push or any of that, uh, if you firmly palpate this region, you'll often get a referred pain. They may have a referred pain anyways as that muscle is, is irritated. And so there's lots of different trigger points. Different muscles have slightly different patterns. But just because there's radiation does not mean it's necessarily a nerve. You do want to consider it and do a good exam and, and rule that out. Uh, but not all that radiates is a uh, nerve pain. So most pain that radiates is actually sclerotomal pain. So with, from the disc, facet, lumbar paraspinal muscles, ligaments, so things we've been talking about, we find the paraspinal muscles and ligaments and somatic dysfunction. Um, so sclerotomal pain can be can refer, but it's usually non-dermatomal, and it's usually dull, and usually doesn't radiate below the knee, uh, also or have associated paresthesias. So ask, that's why we ask those questions: if it radiates, well, what's that pain like? If it's more sharp, electric, going all the way to the foot, that's more. Uh, nerve origin versus, as we described here, for sclerotomal pain. Uh, again, those are good generalities, will lead you in the right direction. Uh, there are always some exceptions, but that should lead you well, and that's why we do a good neurologic exam to look for neurologic deficits as a part of a good physical. Uh, just to mention ankylosing spondylitis, uh, you might have covered that with some of the reactive arthritis uh, that you've covered, uh, but it's going to be more of a dull back pain. Worse in the morning usually begins before age 40. It's more of a stiffness in nature. It's worse with rest because it gets more stiff, improves with activity. Schober's test may be positive, so that's you can measure 10 centimeters in the lumbar spine, and when you flex, or when the patient flex forward, that measurement increases by less than five centimeters, meaning that there's lack of flexibility in the lumbar region. So the classic x-ray finding is the bamboo spine, but that's often a late finding. So an MRI can detect earlier changes if you're suspicious. Often associated with enthesitis. So enthesitis is the inflammation and pain at the attachment sites of uh, tendons, ligaments, and muscles. Uh, so the Achilles and plantar fascia uh, can have some enthesitis uh, associated with ankylosing spondylitis. HLA-B27 is positive. In the majority of cases, it's not necessarily diagnostic, however, but highly correlative. HLA-B27. Okay, next case, we've got a 45-year-old female who presents with low back pain that radiates down her left leg. The pain happened suddenly about a week ago when she was moving some boxes in her garage. Um, she hasn't really improved with rest or ibuprofen. She knows your DO, so she wants you to just pop her back back into place. So, of course, what do you do? You pop it back into place. No, you don't. You want to do a good history and physical first. So, on further history, she says, well, it's a severe and burning electric pain uh, that's radiating down. It moves from her lower back down her leg and into her foot. She's got some numbness in her left lower leg. She denies fever, chills, bowel, or bladder incontinence. Uh, no risk factors for osteoporosis, no cancer history, no IV drug use. 
physical exam, you've got two out of four reflexes in the patella regions on both sides. The Achilles reflex is absent on the left, uh, but two out of four on the right. Straight leg raise is positive on the left. Sensation is decreased on her left lateral foot. So we've got some neurologic signs. So again, left lateral foot. So the lateral foot, S1. Uh, she had some lack of Achilles reflex. So we've got a couple things saying there's a problem with this L5 S1 disc, or at least that nerve root of S1. So good time to discuss relative contraindications to OMT. Uh, for her, we wouldn't just automatically say, oh yeah, let's pop your back. We did a good history, we did a good physical, we've got some neurologic signs, so HVLA for lumbar spine might not be the best choice at this time. Uh, so again, I say relative contraindications to OMT, because sometimes you can do some gentle indirect treatments to unrelated areas, as long as they don't exacerbate the problem. Uh, or delay definitive care. So if you've got a fracture, you wouldn't do, want to do any OMT directly over that region. Uh, if there's dislocations, they, they need to be reduced. You wouldn't want to just um, arbitrarily doing a HVLA or articulatory technique. Recent trauma, if you don't have a diagnosis yet, it's it's okay to, uh, to wait and get a further workup. Infections, acute neurologic signs, as in this case, cauda equina, so bladder, bladder problems, saddle, saddle anesthesia, you would not want to delay a more definitive care. Osteoporosis, you might want to avoid HVLA if there's going to be any sort of pressure on the bone with the thrust. You wouldn't want to cause a compression fracture. Uh, if they've got a history of cancer or possible metastasis, again, you wouldn't want to thrust directly over that bone for risk of uh, fracture. So these kind of line up to, as we're working through our differential of low back pain, more so these severe, urgent diagnoses, we probably would want to be very cautious with our osteopathic manipulation or avoid it uh, altogether. So this, she likely has a disc herniation. Um, so this one you can see the disc often herniates posterior laterally is why it compresses on a nerve root. Here we've got a T2 weighted MRI image. You can see there's the disc is herniating posteriorly, putting pressure on the cord a little bit. It's getting close to the cord. It's definitely contacting and interrupting this CSF flow. Here on this side, you can see this disc is, is pushing outwards and putting pressure on this nerve root. So you might hear terms of disc bulge versus herniation. So a disc bulge is a symmetric circumferential extension of the disc beyond the inner space whereas a disc herniation is a focal or asymmetric extension of the nucleus pulposus. So the inside of the disc actually is coming out in a herniation where a, a bulge, the annulus is typically intact. Herniations typically occur posterior laterally uh, and they can repair themselves. So most discs actually can repair themselves within six months. Uh, so unless it is causing nerve compression, it may not be the source of back pain. So they've done studies where they've taken people without back pain and done NMRIs on them, and over 25%, some of them are up to 30, 40% of people without low back pain have disc herniations on MRI. So the herniations themselves aren't necessarily the cause of the pain. So you want to see if that fits their clinical signs and symptoms and the findings on exam before you assume that's the entire reason for their low back pain. Uh, you can also get irritation from the chemicals inside the disc that can irritate the nerves and lead to pain. So it's not just the pressure on the nerve, the, those uh, inflammatory mediators can irritate the nerves and lead to pain as well as a discogenic cause of low back pain. Uh, so for radicular pain, that's when the lateral recess stenosis typically uh, from that posterior disc protrusion in combination with some maybe some facet or hypertrophy. So you've got some narrowing of that uh, foramina where the nerve comes out combination of that and or the disc uh, can lead to pressure on the nerve causing radiculopathy which is just a disturber disease a disease of the spinal nerve typically sharp and electric pain present with dermatomal distribution of symptoms and they usually compress the more inferior nerve so if there's an l4 l5 disc it's going to compress the l5 nerve root whereas an l5 s1 disc herniates to compress the s1 nerve root and the vast majority, 90-95% of herniations, occur at these two levels, L4, L5, and L5, S1. 
And here's a visual from Netters talking about that based on how those spinal nerves run. So this L4, L5 uh, disc is going to put pressure on this L5 spinal nerve because of how that runs posteriorly uh, to the disc in that region. So the natural history of a disc herniation is favorable in most patients. So they've done sequential MRI studies to show that the herniated portion of the disc goes back in with time and that up to two-thirds of the cases resolve in six months. So only about 10% of patients have sufficient pain after six weeks of conservative care um, where surgery is considered. So just because somebody has comes in with an acute herniated disc doesn't necessarily mean they're going to end up uh, being treated surgically. Uh, the vast majority of them will, he will heal or recover to a degree where that's not necessary. Uh, so again, just to revisit some of those uh, red flags. Uh, so if you've got a herniated, uh, suspected herniated disc and it's acute and it pushes posteriorly on that cauda equina, you might get urinary retention, overflow incontinence, fecal incontinence, bilateral uh, motor deficits, saddle anesthesia, and it's a medical emergency. Uh, but it only occurs in about 0.04% of low back pain cases. So not very common, uh, but again, you don't want to miss it. Uh, so common things you see, genital urinary dysfunction, 90% of people with cauda equina will present with that. Saddle anesthesia, so it's part of your neurologic exam. If you're um, suspicious, you might have to check the perianal region uh, for neurologic or sensory problems or you can ask them can you if you've white if you're wiping can you feel that or does that lost sensation that can give you a clue as well uh, most co commonly caused again by acute her her herniated discs if it's more of a slow chronic process it, it it's often less severe uh, so these are usually acute um, problems so urgent spinal decompression is indicated to prevent permanent neurologic damage Here's a picture of that as that cauda equina uh, comes down. You can just see how a, it would be a significant herniated disc, but how a posterior herniated disc could compress that, that bundle. All right, next case, a 75-year-old female presents with low back pain. The pain is dull in nature and has been progressively worse over the last six months. She describes radiation of the pain into both legs with ill-defined numbness bilaterally as well. She states the pain is worse when standing up straight, but improves when bending over or when using a shopping cart when she's at the store. She denies bowel or bladder problems. Further exam, you uh, check the heart rate and you check for pulses in lower extremity. You check abdomen, so there's no tenderness, no mass. She's at an age where maybe an aneurysm might be um, possible. So checking uh, your physical exam to rule in or rule out your differential, musculoskeletal, thoracic kyphosis, bilateral peripheral muscle hypertonicity, so pretty nonspecific, but some biomechanical changes, reflexes, one out of four with the patella and Achilles bilaterally, so symmetric, but decreased, strength is four out of five bilaterally, a little weak, she has a slightly decreased sensation bilaterally, but does not seem to follow a clear dermatome. So we've got some some neurologic findings, but they're nonspecific and non-focal. Um, so this is a case of spinal stenosis. So we said radiculopathy is irritation of a spinal nerve. Myelopathy is disturbance or disease of the spinal cord. So with aging, the central canal stenosis occurs as degenerative changes progress. So if you get hypertrophy of the soft tissues, that can be 40% of the spinal stenosis. Uh, so again, so we got that spondylosis. Um, degenerative changes in the disc space, uh, facet joint arthritis, that actually leads to uh, hypertrophy of the, like the ligamentum flavum and other soft tissues, and all of that can lead to um, narrowing of the area around the spinal cord. So again, with extension, the, the hypertrophied ligament buckles centrally into the spinal canal, so that is why it can worsen and why... Um, flexion is actually better because it actually removes that and actually slightly lengthens the spinal cord. So these are better with flexion and often worse with extension. So the primary presentation, pain in the buttocks, thighs, and legs. 
often accompanied by paresthesias, but they're not dermatomal because this is a cord level issue and not a nerve root level issue. So neurogenic claudication is induced by standing erect or walking. So if they walk for a long period of time, the pain gets worse. As opposed to vascular claudication is similar signs and symptoms, but that's due to vascular obstruction or atherosclerosis of the vessels of the leg. So this is relieved by sitting or flexing forward. So that's that positive shopping cart classic uh, finding. So they do better leaning forward because of the flexion component. They have gait disturbances due to leg weakness. They, um, bowel and bladder incontinence is uncommon, um, and that's due to the, this is a slow process as opposed to an acute process like the cauda equina. They can occur, but they're uncommon. Neurogenic claudication is the most indicative symptom, so it's, but it's important to assess the vasculature. Uh, exam, you may have weakness, decreased reflexes, decreased sensation, uh, doesn't seem to associate with a particular nerve root, and often bilateral. All right, next, we've got a 25-year-old male with back pain and right-sided pain. It started abruptly yesterday. The pain radiates into his anterior hip and groin. Pain is 10 out of 10 in severity. Uh, you notice his, you do a good review of system, and he complains of some dysuria and hematuria. He's afebrile. His pulse is 90, respiration is 20. He's unable to sit still, in extreme discomfort, bent over to the right. He's got some mild guarding uh, on his abdomen, but you're able to assess. Um, and it's soft and non-tender. He's got some costovertebral angle tenderness, so as tender point on the right, uh, but normal reflexes. So it seems to be something neurologic, so maybe a stone, a kidney stone, due to the, the radiating pain. He's unable to sit still, severe pain, blood in his urine, pain in his urine, positive CVA tenderness. No signs of an infection at this point, so if he had a fever uh, and so forth, findings on your analysis, maybe that's pyelonephritis, um, or if he's right lower quadrant pain, maybe the appendix, uh, those didn't seem to pan out, but he does have uh, definitely a, a uro urologic issue at, at hand, so urolithiasis, uh, or ureter stones, so it usually starts in the flank, radiates down the side, into the groin, so you can get nausea and vomiting due, due to the pain, can have blood in the urine, um, usually costovertebral angle or flank tenderness. It's unable to get into a comfortable position. A non-contrast CT is the imaging study of choice, and um, you'll discuss more treatment and management as you get uh, further along into uh, renal system two. So while we're talking about urologic causes of back pain, uh, prostate cancer is important to consider. So if it, it often metastasizes to the lumbar spine, uh, so if they've got a family history of back pain, they haven't uh, been up on their, or excuse me, family history of prostate cancer, or they haven't kept up on their cancer screenings, you consider this. You might do a prostate exam, uh, would reveal firm nodules, lab would reveal elevated PSA. You may have some bony tenderness to palpation or to percussion if there's metastasis into the lumbar spine. Abdominal aortic aneurysm. Another referred cause of low back pain you don't want to miss, highly associated with smoking and atherosclerosis, um, or if you've got a connective tissue disease that sets you up for it, such as Marfan's. Almost 75% of patients with uh, abdominal aortic aneurysms are asymptomatic. Um, this, it can be discovered on routine exam examination or if you're ordering another uh, study. Uh, consider it if you've got abdominal pain radiating to the back, back or flank pain, and or a pulsatile abdominal mass. Uh, you can see it on ultrasound or CT, and surgery may indicate it if it's greater than 5.5 centimeter. So if there's a rupture of this aneurysm, that is then an emergent um, uh, condition that needs uh, surgical care immediately. So quick summary. So how we can work through low back pain. We want to make sure it's not urgent or emergent. So not very common, less than 1% of low back pain, but we want to make sure and rule that out. Cauda equina syndrome, so we're looking for bowel or bladder incontinence, saddle anesthesia, uh, or other sources of referred pain. Abdominal aortic aneurysm would have a pulsatile abdominal mass. Uh, they might have hypotensive changes, asymmetry of pulses if it's ruptured. Urolithiasis, uh, flank pain, colicky in nature, hematuria or dysuria is usually present. Uh, compression fracture 
Um, so if you've got bony tenderness to palpation over the vertebrae, x-ray findings can help you with that. So is it an osteoporosis fracture versus a metastatic cancer? We need to identify why they had this fracture if, in case we need to address an underlying disease process. Neurologic causes of back pain, spinal stenosis is the myelopathy, usually from herniated disc or degenerative changes. Uh, older age, bilateral signs and symptoms that aren't dermatomal, often gait disturbances. So you need to follow these patients, make sure that their symptoms aren't progressing, otherwise they may need intervention. Radiculopathy, so that's one side, spinal nerve, uh, primarily usually secondary to herniated discs or degenerative changes, and uh, they follow their neurologic signs and symptoms. If they resolve with conservative care, they can avoid surgery. If they become severe or longer standing, they need some surgical decompression. Inflammatory, we've got reactive arthritis, you've got ankylosing spondylitis. Uh, the key to that is morning stiffness, decreased flexion, bamboo spine is a classic finding on x-ray, and you might have some enthesitis of the Achilles uh, concomitantly. Facet arthritis, degenerative changes uh, to the facet joints, worse with extension, and some radiation of pain can occur, but you shouldn't have any neurologic deficits if only the facet joints are involved. Lumbar sprain and strain um, can be due to postural strain, injury, uh, myofascial trigger points can be uh, contribute to this, and of course somatic dysfunction uh, can contribute to the pain in all of these. They can have concomitant, uh, uh, concomitant somatic dysfunction with any of these disease states, and as long as they're getting the appropriate care, you can treat with uh, OMT and provide some symptomatic relief, even if you're unable to fix the uh, narrowing around the spinal cord or the herniated disc, you can still provide some uh, symptomatic relief, give the nerve just a little bit more space and improve symptoms. Um, again, as long as you're know what you're treating and you're not delaying definitive treatment, uh, osteopathic manipulation can go along with many of these uh, clinical conditions. Um, so we're looking for some act dysfunction um, and we're going to treat uh, what we find and improve the function of the body as a whole.